introduce myself quickly. I'm Larry Berlin, I'm a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley, and uh, I'm not on the panel. I am just here to moderate the panel. And basically, what your sellers want to know make this a trouble free, easy transaction put to a successful closing without a lot of bus and bus. And to that end, we have a distinguished panel of home inspectors, and oil educators, bank removal, junk lovers, and stagers. So let me introduce them. And the format that I see, feel free to jump in at any time, is I'll introduce each panelist try to start discussion with a question for them to field and if you think of anything that would be interesting for you to know or you think would be interesting for the group to know, please feel free to raise your hand, call on you, and ask questions you might want to ask questions. Okay. That being said, our first panelist is Joe Monaco from All State Home Inspection Company in North Jersey. And a licensed home inspection company in New Jersey. Inspections, the full residential and commercial inspections, and uh, certified FHA permit certifications, mold testing, radon testing, and, and other things uh, that some of the other panelists do. So I'm not going to go into to that area at the moment, but um, it's a uh, family run business, Joe Manico Sr. and Jr., and uh, both are licensed inspectors. They will be on site for your inspection. So um, that's all state. Uh, Susan Jeanette. Correct Janet. Janet. Just like the girl's first name. Okay. Susan Jen is a licensed realtor and she's an accredited continuing education instructor for the New Jersey Real Estate Commission. She serves as program director and energy advocate for the partnership for real estate and oil success. That's a nonprofit educational program for realtors selling oil heated properties. She's educated thousands of realtors, home inspectors, attorneys, buyers, and sellers across the country and has earned a reputation as the go to source when dealing with questions and concerns surrounding the listing and sale of oil heated homes. Uh, before joining Pro, Susan was Director of Education for the North Central Jersey Association of Realtors and uh, one of only five Garden State MLS Tempo Trainers for top producing realtors for small office divisions across seven states and in the Prudential Real Estate Franchise. Susan is an, an, an avid animal lover and founder and president of Rosemary's Rescue Ranch, a local animal rescue organization. <coughs> Scott Lafer. He is the owner of Hawkeye Services. Uh, he has a BA in Environmental Studies from Aramco College, and he has 19 years in the oil tank. He has 19 years of oil tank industry experience. Um, he's going to speak of the importance of doing a proactive oil tank sweep to ensure that there's no surprises when the buyer ultimately performs a sweep. Where many a real estate transaction has been held up along the way because of an oil tank issue that was discovered in the course of inspections. So oil tank issues are a major issue and an undisclosed tank could potentially derail an otherwise perfect transaction. Uh, Jean Marie uh, is a is uh, CPO Posse Partner LLC. Um, Jean Marie left her last name off of this. Uh, it's Heron. I'm sorry. I did. It threw, it, 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 no, on my on my. Oh, sheet. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it threw me for a minute. Rain cloud. <laughs> Jean Marie. <laughs> Do I have that right? Yep. Okay. Um, she is with uh, CPO SSD Partners LLC. CPO, which is a certified professional organizer. Certified professional organizer. And um, if the listing agreement is signed and it's time to market the house, what do we do? Our best advice is to educate, 
you know, listing clients to help. That help is available in staging the house and preparing the process for marketing. And uh, I believe a great professional organizer really would be the one. Uh, and last but not least, we have Jeff Wilmer. He's the franchise owner of Junk Lovers. He's a former investment banker turned active real estate investor. He's still investing in real estate. He got involved into the furniture and junk removal business just 2015, so two years ago. Uh, junk Lovers franchise owner, territories include Morris, Essex, Passaic, Hudson, and Bergen counties. They operate from a location in Hackensack, and their business is the removal of pretty much anything and everything, and we serve both commercial and residential clients. And residential clients. So, with that, I'm going to break back to Romano and uh, ask you to tell a little bit about the business and what happens when uh, you inspect the property. Go there and see, you know, go there with two inspectors. So, why don't I start with that question? Why are two inspectors on the case? Well, like I said, my son and I have been this many years I've been doing inspections long before my hair turned white. <laughs> I'm being married over 40 years old, that's not good. But anyway, uh, uh, we find it's uh, very, very efficient. Uh, two inspectors, uh, we, can get, we can get them done a lot quicker. Uh, usually a three bed, one and a half bed house. Ninety-five percent of the inspection is done at the time of the inspection, and then uh, we just bring it down to the mainframe and uh, just go over it once and then mail everything out. So uh, we're pretty good with, uh, with getting reports out in 24, sometimes 48 hours, depending on how busy we are. Uh, the most important thing uh, uh, is we're very. My, my wife's been a realtor for over 35 years, so I know your end of it. I know what goes on. We're not alarmists. We don't uh, try and scare anybody. Oh, you got water in the basement. This and that. We just tell them it is what it is. Recommend this. Recommend that. Uh, now, a pre-listing -pre inspection. What you want to do with a pre-listing inspection is just trying to head off any major problems that you're going to get. That will hold up your closing or kill or kill the deal. All right. Uh, Can I just interrupt a second? Yeah. And ask? How many realtors in the room have had a contract that went to a home inspection where it absolutely cleared up the deal? It's not, not uncommon, right? I mean, something just usually not well liked. <laughs> you, know, you don't create the problem, you find the problem, right? So the other side of the coin is when you're representing the buyer, they want a home inspection too. Um, you do the inspection, you can do it before, obviously, before the property is sold. Um, that inspection could be given to a potential buyer? That's, uh, well, there's two ways we, two ways we do a privilege inspection. We can just do a walkthrough of the client, take as many notes as they want. It's just going to be on the major elements of the home. We'll take a look at the structure. We'll take a look at the roof. We'll see if there's any water damage. Uh, but that type, that type of pre-listing inspection, we're not checking every window, we're not checking every outlet. Uh, if, if, we, if they want that type of inspection, it's going to be a full report and it's going to be the same price as a, as a regular inspection, which I recommend to people. Right? Because, you know, let's face it, if you, if you don't check a window that, that's, that's not working properly, some windows can be very expensive. But we can do it either way. Well, once we get into a detail, then it's going to be a full report. That's usually what I recommend. So, let's assume a realtor with some, and they're making recommendations to make the transaction trouble-free, fluid, no surprises. You would recommend do a full inspection? I would recommend it. Yeah. Pay for the 
inspection. On the other side, can this inspection be like assigned or given to the with with the uh, with the permission of the person I'm working for? Well, of course, that's up to them. They would want to, right? I mean, they would, they would. Yeah. So, in in essence, uh, as a negotiating tool, is it something that they could say, "Well, look, you don't have to pay for an inspection. This is a licensed inspector." Well respected in the industry, if you accept his inspection as an inspection, and you don't have to do your own, you can eliminate that as part of the contract. Does that ever happen? No, it really usually <laughs> does. <laughs> no way he he's, not, he's not my guy, not it's interested. One of the, did they write everything down or they uh, everything you know, disclosed? You know, so I always recommend a full inspection, but there are times when you just don't want to walk through. Right. There are times. The most important thing is, is uh, you want to head off any big problems. Uh, for example, if you, if you have a problem, whatever it is, and, and a, a contractor is going to come in and, and charge $1,000 to fix it, the buyer wants $5,000 worth of credit. You know? So these are the things that really screw her. You know? So you, you just want to uh, have everything out in front black and white after that. Whether they want to fix it, whether they don't, that's in everybody else's hand. We don't tell we don't tell anybody how much something is to fix. It's not our job. Sometimes we'll recommend people, sometimes I don't. It depends on who we're dealing with. Do you do mold inspection? Yes, that's we do mold testing, we do air samples, we do swabs. What's the difference, the differential in price between a walkthrough and a... A walkthrough can anywhere be, be, depending on the size of the home, anywhere from $400 and up. A home inspection, we don't, we don't quote, we'll give them a rough idea of a home inspection price. Let's say it's a three bed, one and a half bed, with radon and termite, we'll say. It should be around 500 but don't hold me to that. We look every home up, we find out the square footage, the age of the home. And then we'll give you we'll give you an exact price, and everything is everything is done ahead of time. Pre-inspection agreements is signed ahead of time. Everything's done electronically. This way, there's no issues when we get to the inspection. Uh, give you an example. We're doing a, a, a townhouse. Uh, I believe it's Saturday. The woman calls up. I have a, I have a, a one-bedroom condo. How much is it? Well, roughly, usually a one-bedroom condo could be two seventy-five. Let's say three hundred dollars, whatever it is. But don't hold us to that. We're going to look up. Turns out I'm doing a 2,000 square foot townhouse. <laughs> you know, so it's you know it's a 400 dollar inspection without radon, without termite. And as you know, townhouses associations if it's on a slab, yes. we may not have to do termite. We may not have to do radon. Is, is the exterior all on the association, or is it not? Yeah. You know, are you responsible for the roof? These are the things we have to know. So a lot of times when we do a townhome, mm -hmm. you just put everything mm -hmm. in and you just say check with the association. And you guys can work it out. So, other questions? Okay. Um, okay. So, other questions? Let's go to Susan. Um, well, why don't you tell the folks what, what I do? do? What do I do? What do you do? Okay. Well, that's pretty interesting in and of itself. First of all, his wife has me beat with her 35 years. I've only been a licensed realtor in the state of New Jersey for 30 years, so not quite as experienced as her. About 10 years ago, I traded in my salesperson's hat to serve as an energy advocate for the Partnership for Realty and Oil Heat Success. It is a nonprofit educational program for realtors. Um, we ask for nothing in return. We don't sell anything. We're not permitted uh, to recommend or refer any one individual contractor, inspector, uh, oil dealer. Our whole purpose is to serve as a non-biased uh, advocate for you, as a resource. So should you have a challenge and you're not sure what next steps to take, you can reach out to me and I will send you in the right direction. I will give you the scenarios um, as an expert. Uh, because I'm a realtor like all of you, I recognize that your challenges don't happen Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. That's when we have meetings. Uh, your challenges happen at 8.30 at night when you get a call from a buyer who's already signed a contract, 
who was cool, close up to say, you know, I was just talking to my best friend's next door neighbor's sister, <laughs> and they said we shouldn't buy that house with oil heat. Well, that's when you get off the phone with them and you text me, and you say, Susan, are you awake? Because if I'm awake, I'll help you. If it's a Saturday morning, and God forbid one of our home inspectors takes a look at that system and says, oh, this has to go, and your buyers feel that they're faced with umpteen thousands of dollars and they're ready to call it quits, text me and say, can you talk? If it's 8.30 in the morning and I'm awake, I'll talk to you. There are so many scenarios that I can help present you with that can save a transaction, that can help a buyer feel more comfortable. So the whole purpose of our program is to dispel myths, to help buyers feel more comfortable, to help educate them through you. We provide materials, wonderful marketing materials, like I have them all up there, the Homeowner's Guide to Heating with Oil, and it covers the most common misconceptions about heating with oil. Like it's expensive, it's dirty, it smells, all these things that people think of when they don't really know the facts about the modern strides. So my role is to help you. Now, as a CE instructor, I run a two-credit, two-hour class. But I come to your offices and speak at your meetings for 15 minutes and give you the, the monarch version, the, the, the skinny version of the CE class. And then you have me as a personal resource for your office. So that's basically what I do. Do you have any, any specific questions? about oil heat that I can address with you? Major myth. One of the major myths is that, well, there's two major myths. Number one, that it's expensive to heat a home with oil. Number two, that it's dirty and it smells. So shall we dispel them right now? Yes. First of all... I grew up in a house with oil heat, so I'm just curious. And if you grew up in a house with oil heat, you loved oil heat because it's the most comfortable, the warmest heat there is. Why didn't you like it? Well, we, I had radiant heat, so I loved our heat. Okay. But when the radiant, it was put in in the 50s. Yes. So as time went on, you had to go through a concrete slab to get it fixed. Well, it was, okay, that was a challenge. That was a challenge. Okay. But if I could afford it, I'd put radiant heat back in my house It's now. so warm, oh. so comfortable. Um, so let's talk about smell. Have you ever walked into a house and smelled oil heat? Yeah. You know, a lot of people have a memory of their grandmother's house. It would always smell like apple pie and oil heat. It was just they would go together. Um, truthfully, you should never smell oil. If you walk into a home and you pick up an odor, if you sense the smell of oil, the best thing you can do is pick up your cell phone and call the listing agent right in front of your buyer so you don't screw it up for any other oil-heated homes and say, hey, I don't even think your seller realizes it, but there's an odor of oil in the house. They need to call for service. Because if there's an odor, it's an early warning detector that there's a problem with the system uh, and they can call someone out and fix it. And so that's why oil heat will never be called the silent killer because there's very low risk of carbon monoxide poisoning and it's non-explosive. Uh, are, are there any regulations about the tanks being inside the house? You know, it's perfectly legal to have a non-leaking underground oil tank uh, holding the oil for your house. It's also perfectly legal to close title on a property with a non-leaking underground oil tank. The problem is not rules, regulations, and laws. The problem is the attorneys. The attorneys don't want to let these transactions go through with an underground oil tank. They don't want to take on a liability down the road five years later when their, their buyer takes the tank out and the leak, God forbid, is discovered, the lawyers aren't willing to take that liability and have so them come how, back. how do you fight that? Here's what you do. It's really recommended, it's truly recommended that if you have a home with an underground oil tank, before you even list it, before you invest your marketing dollars in that property um, and your time and energy, have the conversation with them about taking that out of the ground. The reason most people won't take that tank out of the ground is Pandora's box, because they're afraid of what's waiting if they open it. People think that, mo that all tanks leak, and they don't want to deal with it. But the truth of the matter is, as a realtor, if you're going to take that listing, you need to find out now if that's a leaking tank or not, before anything goes further. It costs about $1,200 to get that tank out of the ground. 
it can cost a little more if it's under a uh, under a porch or uh, under the driveway. You have to compensate for that. But an, an ordinary, normal underground oil tank should cost about twelve hundred dollars. You can replace it with an above ground, double walled uh, tank that can either go in the basement or on the side of the house. It can go in an enclosure. So you can't put it back in the ground. You can. It's perfectly legal to put a tank yeah. back in the ground. Today's underground tanks are made with fiberglass. They're boats. And they're not actually touching the ground. There's a platform that's built and they're put on a platform. But from a real estate point of view, we never recommend that. Because why would you want to put a tank back in the ground and then have trouble selling the house down the road? So it's always better to take it out. These things were not intended to stay in the ground forever. If the roof is lifting, we have no compunction about saying, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that that roof is reaching the end of its life. You're in the house looking for leaks as you walk through the house. But the tank is out of sight, out of mind, and it should be addressed. So your focus on getting confused on oil heat success, but you're saying even if there is no problem to tell the homeowner to take the tank out and put it inside the basement. The property is more saleable within about So that you're tank. propagating for us to tell people do that when we first list the house. I recommend that as a realtor. Recommend I recommend that as a realtor. Isn't it easier to sell a home with an above ground tank than with an underground tank? Yes. You have a whole bevy of buyers that are going to, this is how to help sellers sell their homes. And you're saying that you should tell the people to do that. I'm really surprised because look at Richwood. What is it, 30, 40 percent oil tanks? Tell them all, take it out and put it in the basement. Those tanks were not intended to last forever. How if the, if the, it should last, the really, they're supposed to last 15 to 25 years. Really? If that home is an old home, however, there's a caveat. If that home is an old, old home, you can feel more confident that that tank is not leaking. Because the older the home, the better quality the materials that were used <laughs> to build those tanks, right? And we know that with the older homes. If it's a house that was built in 1970, get that tank out of the ground. Wow. These were not intended to last forever. You wouldn't leave a roof on the house for 50 years. If you did, you'd have leaks everywhere. So, yes, I am advocating for removing tanks and replacing them with above ground tanks. They shouldn't be in the ground forever. Well, I think that that's in the context of trying to make it a smooth and trouble-free transaction. Because at the end of the day, people buy it, they find out about it, they do a little research, and then they say, ah, who needs it? I don't care. I don't want it. But if it's taken care of, before the fact, it's a, eliminated it's a the problem. issue and you got, and it's turned a lemon into lemonade by saying, hey look, you got a brand new tank and I don't know how long you're going to be here, but you'll never have to replace it. You're probably going to sell that house faster for more money if the tank is above ground than if it's underground, and that's just a fact. Do they insure the above ground tanks like they do the underground? There are there are there is a program called Tank Shore for undergrounds and ProGuard for undergrounds, and that is transferable to a new owner. And the above ground tanks, the new ones, come with a million dollar policy. They're uh, yeah guarantee. It sounds like they'll never have to pay that thing so they can make a million dollars. That's guarantee. correct. The inside of the above ground tanks, the women got it right. They're made with Tupperware. The inside is the material very similar to tu Tupperware doesn't leak. We know that. And so the inside is really a plastic material similar to Tupperware that um, is secure. And they are alarmed. So if, God forbid, there is a um, compromise, there's a manufacturing defect, it will leak into itself and an alarm will go off so you can call for help. The new tanks are intended not to ever leak to touch the ground. Yes? When you said before that, uh, Oil heat is the, it's the warmest heat. It's a, how, what does that mean? How is it warmer than like gas? Well, um, because, let's see, how is it warmer than gas? Um, it's a more even heat, the way it works. It's more even, and with the radiators, the way that they radiate off and the um, radiant floors is a warmer heat that um, it feels warmer. Do they have, uh, I guess it's what you think in you have oil radiant heat, that's one thing. Do you have oil 
um, forced hot air. air. Forced yes, hot there air. is oil forced air. And one thing you always want to do, if you have a cellar that has uh, forced air with oil, make sure, or with anything, even with gas, this is just while we're talking about cellars, make sure they clean out those ducts. Because what's going to happen is the buyer's going to take a look at the cobwebs inside the ducts, and they're going to think that your fuel is dirty and that that's a problem with the oil heat and not a problem. That's just a, a careless homeowner who hasn't been maintaining their ductwork. So make sure they do that. And if you see streaks behind radiators, if you see those streaks, that's not soot. Those streaks behind radiators is common household dust that has fallen down and the heat from the radiator has baked it onto the wall. So if you have a cellar and they have those beautiful radiators, make sure they take out some Windex and clean behind them because it does perpetuate the misconception that oil heat is dirty. Did you have a question? You did, but it's gone. I, I did, but I, I... It'll come back. Oh, yeah, no, Good. I wanted Why, if, if oil heat is really clean, Mm -hmm. Okay, and it works well. Mm -hmm. it's, the heat is good. Why aren't they putting it in new homes? Uh, misconceptions. A lot of it is misconception. People just they gas heat is sexier. People like gas heat. Everybody wants natural gas. But what they don't realize is that the benefits of oil heat, and that's why I have a job. Prices, you know, oil heat is 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 the, is the best price it's been in a very long time. And it's all cyclical. People think oil heat is expensive because they think back to 2008 when it was in the news and when we had to fill up our SUVs at the gas station and it was costing us $100 to fill up our tanks. It's all correlated. Well, that was a blip in the market back in 2008. It's all cyclical, just like real estate is cyclical. When you've been in real estate as long as I have, you know that if the market is, is quote, unquote, it's a bad market, it doesn't phase you, but you do your work, your busy work then, because it's going to come back around. It always comes back around. Well, with oil heat, it's about a 30 to 40 year cycle, and if you trace it back to 1972, odd even days. Who remembers odd even oh, yes. days? <laughs> that was the last blip. So it jumped from 1972 to 2008. We're in a really good place with oil heat right now. And according to Forbes, consider today's prices the ceiling, and it's only predicted to get better from here for the next three to five years. So Are there areas within the state that don't allow you to use oil heat for any reason, you don't prefer the gas? No, it's just no. that you know it, a lot of it is advertising. The gas companies are really good on advocating for themselves. They're on the radio, no they're on TV, it's very easy. The oil heat is trying to keep up with, with the um, education, with, with keeping the consumer educated about oil heat. That's why I have a job. I go all over the country doing this. So. I guess in, in the more rural areas, there's no gas line per se. Right. You have to choose between either putting in an oil tank or a propane okay. tank. And then you, which one would explode? That's, I, I have a huge fear of propane. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, any other questions? And I can cover any topic. I don't want to take up the time here. Mm -hmm. but, come back. Okay, great. Okay, interrelated. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>, buddy. <laughs> so, uh... Hello everybody, Scott Lifer, Hawkeye Services, thank you all for coming out. Um, I primarily do oil tank sweeps, um, and I've been in this industry for about 19 years at this point. Um, uh, I have an environmental studies degree from Ramapo College, so uh, yeah, I know this area well, um, and uh, I, I expected to disagree with what you were saying, but your message is, is absolutely uh, <laughs> on point. Get those tanks out of the ground, that's the bottom line. Um, and that's only going to help you guys. So, um, I, I, like I said, I've been doing this for 19 years. I started this company about three years ago. Uh, and like I said, all I do are oil tank sweeps. That's my main business. Is everybody familiar with what that means, oil tank sweeps? All right. So I'll start fresh. Um, I go out to make sure that there are no surprise underground oil tanks as part of a real estate transaction. Uh, so basically, I start generally on the interior of the home. Uh, look for any evidence of previous oil service uh, by the furnace uh, on any of the interior basement walls that are accessible. 
um, uh, any crawl spaces, any garages. I'm looking for fuel lines, which are generally either one or two uh, copper lines, either coming in through the foundation wall, drainage patches on the foundation wall that are accessible, uh, a trench between the wall and the furnace, or obviously fuel lines, uh, copper lines coming up by the furnace area itself. That's what I'm looking for visually. From there, I go to the outside of the home, and I'm looking for any evidence of pipes that may indicate an oil tank. Uh, so this, I have a prop, is, who knows what that is? A walking stunt. Close. That's a vent. Oh, I see it. That's a vent. That's a vent. You got it. That is a vent pipe for an oil tank. Right. So you can guess what color the house was. They paint them to blend them into the house. Most people don't know what this is, especially, you know, homeowners that have never had oil. Um, if you see this elbowing up along the structure of a home, they either had a tank or still have a tank underground. And that be outside the house? That's on the exterior of the home, elbowing up along the foundation wall of the house, correct? And you'll see this much? That's as much as you'll see? You can see this whole this whole thing was sticking up. I actually okay. wrapped it to protect myself from the, the soil that was on it. But yeah, so you can see just a little nub of it. You can see like that much of it, or you can see it going all the way up to the roof line sometimes. Wow. How can right. you tell there's a tank up there? So those two indications that I just referenced was, you know, the interior uh, fuel lines by the furnace right. and the walls, or like a vent pipe like this. But that could indicate that there was oil. Right. Right. You got it. So it doesn't mean that there still is a tank. Right. A lot of companies remove tanks, but neglect to remove the vent pipe, unfortunately. How would you know? You hire me to do a tank sweep. <laughs> so then, <laughs> from there, <laughs> from there, I go out and I scan the property with a metal detector. There you go. So uh, it's a it's a very industry specific metal detector. Uh, it doesn't pick up the good stuff, you know, the the gold, the silver, uh, none of that. Unfortunately, I got a lot of people saying, oh, "I lost my wedding ring in the in the garden ten years ago." <laughs> Sorry, you're out of luck. <laughs> That's not what I do. Uh, but I'm looking for large, uh, airy readings that are characteristic of the tank. Okay, so I, I basically walk a grid pattern throughout the property and I see if there's any large readings that could potentially be an oil tank. All right, uh, no, what separate, yes, go ahead. So if somebody has like a patio, can you ascertain whether there's something under the patio? Good question. It depends on how the patio was constructed. All right, so concrete patios uh, sometimes will have rebar, which is basically uh, reinforced uh, steel bars running through it to, to give the, the concrete structural stability that unfortunately prohibits me from being able to scan those areas because the rebar will look like, it's going to look like a big oil tank to me. <laughs> um, some will have wire mesh, same, same problem. Um, a lot of patios don't have that. So if it's like a paver patio, brick patio, even concrete patios, some do, some don't. So it, it's, uh, you don't know until you get out there and, and, and check. All right, um, with, with that said, um, if say I see a pair of fuel lines going out the back wall of the house, there's a concrete patio there, there's rebar, what I would then recommend is a more involved process called ground penetrating radar. All right, so it's basically, um, so whereas, whereas I use a metal detector, this does not have the, um, the downside of, of, of uh, picking up on uh, metal. It just, it, what it does, it looks like a lawnmower, it bounces signals down through the ground, bounces off whatever objects are there, comes back to a receptor and shows an image on a screen. Now it's not like a picture uh, or, or an ultrasound really. What is that called? Again? Ground penetrating radar, GPR. Yep. And and what it, it's it's a bunch of wavy lines. You know what a fish finder a screen looks like? That's what it looks like. Uh, but the GPR technician is able to decipher between what they're looking for is something that images like a tank, has the curvature, the bell curve at the top of a tank. And that will allow them to differentiate between you know nothing or rebar or a tank. Yes. So when like you would know when to advise right. to do that. Correct. Yep. Okay. So. And sometimes. what's the cost for that as a cost differential to just a regular? Sure. Well, uh, cost-wise in general, um, you know, I'll just tell you what I charge. Uh, you know, for a standard oil tank sweep. So I what separates me from a lot of my competitors is I do the whole property. So it's based on the size of the lot. But for a standard sweep, a half acre or less, a uh, tank sweep is 275 with a metal detector. Uh, ground penetrating radar um, is usually 650. Okay. It's not cheap. Yes. I'm sorry, how much was a half acre or less? Uh, 275. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Are there any records? I know there aren't records from past, past, just from experience for 
my mother's tank. We actually sold the house with the tank in the ground five years ago. Wow. Wow. It was a brand new tank. Good okay. job. She had insurance. Okay. And an insurance company approached her and said, it's X amount of years old, you have to replace the tank. Yeah. And it happened about nine months before the state mandated that they had to be put above ground. So she was allowed to put it in ground. But we had a lot of problems with testing. Got it. Okay. So when they pulled it out, they went like this and left oil. Thanks. Oh, yeah. We would, yeah. My, and it was a whole thing. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. I could, I could school you on how to work with the state on that. But anyway. Was there um, a leak? No, they leaked it when they pulled it. Oh, yeah. it was the issue. Yeah. She has a neighbor that's got three tanks on her, probably. They just kept putting the new ones up. You no, know, that was the 50s. Yeah. Yep. I think the 60s. The house was built in 40, something 40. Well, anyway, so I know it going past to the 70s and 80s, there are no records on right. even who has a tank. Are there any records now that you can go back to? Uh, simple answer, no. Uh, um, yeah. You can check with the municipality, do an OFA request, pull, you know, pull the permits. It's always good advice in general. Um, at the end of the day, it's been my experience that every town has had a fever, a fire, or a flood, and they lost all the records. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the neighbor of the place. Uh, so it's usually a dead end. Um, you might be able to get a permit that was a tank removed or a tank was filled. Great, but that's, you know, uh, Are they keeping records now? Nope. There's no document, as far as I'm aware of, there's no formal record of anything. Unless the tank leaks, then it becomes a DEP and a state issue, right. and then there's document. That's it documented. Is, the it's all over the, the DEP okay. doesn't want to know anything about it unless there is a problem. They Correct. don't want to know the areas that are clean. That's right. There's no database of that, no. That's sad. So if a tank comes out clean, it's just a municipal issue, so the, the township only, and the state is not involved. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, permits weren't required to remove oil tanks until uh, what, 85 or 87. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? So I didn't know what this lady just said, state mandated they have to be above ground. I don't know about that either. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. That's what my mother, that's what we were told I don't when think that's true. the state got involved yeah. with the ground testing. I don't, I don't think that's a, uh, a definitive statement. I think well, I that's what sure. we were told. There's no yeah. state law yeah. requiring no. that tanks be removed. No. And, um, <laughs> and also... Not be removed, be put up, if you were replacing a tank. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, no. maybe it was just oh, okay. Burton yeah. County or Rochelle Park. Maybe. They were not allowing the tank to go it back. Could be, That's very possible. Uh, yes, the municipality isn't permitting it. But um, it's perfectly legal to put a uh, a new fiberglass tank in the ground. I'll have to find my old documents because yeah. it was a document we received or it did state and that in there. remind me when we move on to talk about if there is a leak because that's really important. Yes, yes. So how, how deep are the oil tanks underground? Average two to three feet to the top of a tank. So, reality-wise, if the tank is leaking, if you have an old tank that is leaking some oil, how much of a real hazard is it? Like, is it, are you going to get cancer if you buy that house and you live there? Or are you going to like, like how how so, bad is it? So here's the 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 DP um, looks at it as a public health issue, the reason <clears throat> being potential impact to groundwater, public drinking water supply. Okay, so that's why that's why this is an issue. Um, these are bare steel tanks, generally put in the ground. Over time, they corrode. It's just how how it works, right? Just like anything that's steel in the ground will corrode. Um, so, once the tank corrodes, it starts leaking into the soils, and then you know, depending on the groundwater lit level or the bedrock level, it'll then uh, permeate down into the groundwater table. If it contaminates the groundwater, then it becomes a lot more complicated, a lot more costly. Uh, and that is the concern. If you have a potable well on the property, you know, obviously that's a concern that it might be contaminating the well from your drinking water source. Um, uh, I heard a long time ago, and I've never confirmed this, that there's a link between bladder cancer and, and fuel oil contamination. I, I've never confirmed that, but I'm just, you know, that, that was my, that was another one of the concerns was that, that correlation. I, I set a question on the cost of, and you may have said that, Susan, before. A new above ground tank? Uh -huh. About $2,300. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just go real quick. Um, it's important on your guys' end to recommend your clients do a proactive tank sweep. The buyers that come in are going to do a tank sweep. It's just the nature of the beast these days. It's as common as a home inspection. 
um, just to make sure that there are no surprise oil tanks underground. Um, so it's in your best interest to kind of circumvent that and kind of cut them off at the chase, if you will, so that way you know firsthand that there's no tank there. Um, you know, I guarantee my sweep, so if I sign off on a property and say there's no tank in all my reports, uh, I, is my guarantee that if I missed a tank, I remove it at my cost. So uh, that, that's one thing that, uh, you know, not everybody does. I also, like I said, do the whole property. Um, there may be paperwork on hand that there was a tank removed, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the tank is uh, not there or that there wasn't a secondary tank. I find those more often than... <laughs> Uh, it surprises me how often that happens. Didn't they used to just fill them? Yep. A lot of tanks were just filled in place with sand or foam and just left. And that was the common uh, you know, approach. Is that an acceptable solution? Uh, it's still legal. But they're all coming out. Buyers, attorneys. Yeah, the attorneys are saying no go. they got to come out of the ground. Right. Yeah. The town of Oakland, I sold a house and it had gas. And then everybody changed and it came along that the new buyers, lawyers, said get the oil tanks, tank sweep anyway, and they did, even though they had gas, and sure enough, there was a filled up tank with sand, and the town of Oakland made them take it out, yeah. right. and they had never used gas or anything, it was horrible. Well, yeah, that's, that's how these things are going, but yeah. Just to protect yourself as a realtor, now we have an addendum to add to the contract, because think of yourself as buyer's agent. Right. You haven't done your due diligence and advised your buyer to do that tank sweep. Yes. Even if they've always had gas or they have an above the ground tank in the basement. Yep. Who's to know they didn't move Absolutely. and not decommission properly? Yep. Never dealt with one above. So as agents, we're extremely liable. That's one thing, and I just want to make a very clear statement which I say to every single realtor I ever meet is put it in writing that you recommend your buyers do an oil tank sweep cover your rear end, because at the end of the day, if they don't do it, right. and there's a tank there, and then they're responsible for dealing with the removal and potential cleanup of that leaking oil tank, they're going to come after everybody they can. So put in an email, say, I recommend you do an oil tank sweep, at least you have it in writing and you, you're, you've cleared yourself from that potential and you have contaminated your neighbor's okay. properties, it's like, it really is over before you and There's no way to know that unless there's soil <coughs> testing. Yep. Now there is grant money available. That's what I wanted to mention about underground tanks. Um, the New Jersey Tank Grant Program uh, is a it used to be a ninety million dollar fund for proactively uh, removing above uh, underground tanks and replacing with above ground tanks. But they ran out of money. They went through the entire ninety million dollars. However, what most people do not realize is that that fund is replenished by 12 million every single year, and that money is earmarked for remediation. Now, if a qualified homeowner has a leak, uh, they, they can apply to the state for remediation reimbursement for up to $500,000. So that's I really that important, I really that important to know that. Is. Now, what else is important is that if they do the remediation, now it's a reimbursement, it's not going to pay for the reimbursement, the remediation, but what's really important is that they need to uh, get that, um, that that no further action letter and get their application into the state ASAP because they are all paid back on a first come first serve basis. They're time stamped and dated. And what I recommend if somebody does discover a leak, make sure the remediation company they hire has a geologist on staff. That's very new in the state of New Jersey. But if they have a geologist on staff, the geologist is authorized to write the no further action letter. So when the cleanup is done, they can get that no further action letter right away. What, when you see these piles of dirt on the front lawn for a year at a time, for eight months at a time, that's because the paperwork in Trenton is being held up. It's bureaucracy that's holding it up, not the actual work. So you can get that no further action letter right after the work is completed if they have a geologist on staff, and not every remediation company offers that. Yes? If there is bound to be soil contamination, or yes. is this covered under any house insurance policies? or? It depends. It could be. Um, 
Uh, I know that, for example, farmers insurance will write a homeowner's policy on a home with an active, non-leaking underground tank, and then if it does leak, it's covered. Um, in many cases, they do cover your next door neighbor. Um, the New Jersey grant monies are available if there is no insurance, or for what the insurance doesn't cover. Maybe the insurance will cover up to ten thousand dollars, but the leak was twenty thousand. You can then apply for the additional ten thousand through the New Jersey grant program. How can you tell that the tank is leaking? Well, you have it tested. You have it tested. Like if a buyer, if a buyer said, "I'm willing to buy this house." But um, I want to have a tank test done, and the test comes up positive. How, what does the tank test include? What is the process? Okay, you have three choices for tank tests. You could do the pressure test, which is where they exert a lot of pressure on the tank, and that's very dangerous. So you have to make sure that you have a very qualified person doing that. And then they listen for pinholes. Uh, they do the vacuum test where they suck the air out, and again, they're listening for pinholes. Or the most non-intrusive test is the electronic probe, with it, it works like you were talking about deep sea fishing, that monitor. They, ha they drop a probe into the tank and they have a monitor with those lines on it and it, it collects sounds so they can see if there's a whistle inside through the sounds, through the, the um, sonar, through sonar. They don't have to dig up the tank to do that? No, no they don't they have, do no, that. those are tank tests. Um, another way that they can find a leak is if the buyer says you got to take that tank out of the ground and the tank, they take the tank out of the ground. Every tank that's removed from the ground is automatically tested. It's mandatory that it gets tested. The company that's doing the work will test it. So if it does test positive for a leak, then you have different challenges. Scott, do you do the testing as well, or just the sweeps? Just tank sweeps. Okay. Yeah. And there's also soil testing this too. Have you came across uh, that you did a sweep and uh, you had a, a large amount of uh, indication that there is a uh, Tank, mm -hmm. but what do you recommend? Like when you do the digging, are you? Uh... It depends on where I get the reading. Okay. All right. So say I do a tank sweep and I find a reading under an asphalt driveway or a patio or something like that, then I would recommend the ground penetrating radar. It's non-intrusive. There's no restoration work. Um, if it's in an open yard area, access accessible digging is always always your better option. You can see so it. have you like done that digging and you found nothing? Yes. Yep. So what are those, uh, you know, large readings? It could like? be, I've, I've found debris. Yeah, refrigerator. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, not too long ago I found a car. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, a Volvo really? underground. Between $90 and $100 an hour while I'm on site. I am a very kind person and there's many things I do behind the scene. I don't have a problem loading my trunk when I leave a client's house and it could be full of electronic recycling and I'll easily drop it off at my you know, local depot on the way home. Um, but in a nutshell, that's how I work. So I really have to see what are their needs and how can I help them and how much of my help do they need. Because I have people who meet me and I explain the organizing process. They have one session with me and they run with it. And they're good, they're golden, because I've now transferred this skill to them. And I have other clients who don't do anything while I'm not there. They're like, I'm gonna wait for Jeanery. You know, Jeanery's gonna come back in a couple days and I'm not touching anything. Um, and, you know, I give homework in between if they're open to, open to it and I tell people, Again, the speed at which we progress on your project has everything to do with how quickly you can make a decision and whether or not you do homework or I do homework in between. Um, I, I actually don't often work with hoarders because hoarding is it's a, it's a mental illness. It's, um, it's a completely different ball game. Most people are not. People are cluttered, you know, but, but most uh, and it, there's also a, a sanitation issue there, and when we get to a certain level on the hoarding scale, I'm not walking in because I, I don't. Well, I mean, you know there. <laughs> He'll go in there. So we'll yeah. save the hoarding question for Jeff. Yes. One more question: Do you have antique dealers for people that have very possibly expensive things? Absolutely. I will tell you right now: I do not know the value of this plastic cup, and I don't know the value of my wedding ring. Well, actually, I do know the value, <laughs> but that was a bad example. Um, when I go into a home and I walk around a house, I look at a painting, I have no clue. So I turn to experts who do. That so trust. That I trust, that I vetted, that I've worked with for years. And when I go into a home and they say they want to sell a lot of things, in my mind, 
I have I actually have an A, B, and a C level company based on the minimum amount that they want to make. So I have an idea, okay, this is a mid-range estate sale, this is a high-end estate sale, this is more like a tag sale, so I can give them so-and-so. Um, I can also work with online auction companies, and I can get an online auction ready as well. In addition to decluttering, do you also do staging? So I am not a certified stager. I do what I call staging light. Um, unfortunately, it's in none of our we have two affiliate staging companies in Real Source, and neither one of them could be there. But often, people, especially many realtors, depending on the price level of the home, if you're going to go above a million, I'm going to highly, highly recommend you get a professional stager in there. Um, but a lot of people feel that what I'm capable of doing is good enough. Um, I'm not a designer. Um, I work with lots of stagers, but often. The way I leave a home, they feel that a photographer can come in and then take the pictures. Uh, but I'm, I'm not a stager. Um, I also recommend that, you know, the way my industry is going to grow is going to be because you folks are out there in the field and you're going to go into somebody's home and you're going to tell, you're going to look at a room, and I don't have before and after pictures today, and you're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm about to have a heart attack because we can't sell it like this. Um, you can take, I'm going to call it that dirty work job and throw me under the bus. You can get me in there because you know that that after picture is going to be beautiful when I'm done. So instead of you being the bad guy, you can shift that job to a professional organizer. But please give advance notice. So I have clients who call me years in advance, and I am not kidding you. I have people who call me five years in advance and say, I want to sell in five years because I know it's going to take me that long to get this house ready. And then I sometimes get calls, Jean Marie, can you come and help me? I'm selling next week. <laughs> and I get these calls. Um, and a lot of times I, I work for some wonderful agents. A lot of agents uh, purchase my services almost like they would purchase a handyman service and they get me in in time. But, you know, I had a situation this week where uh, the realtor had me in on Monday and um, tomorrow the house is going on the market. And my heart was in my throat because I'm like, oh, we have five days. And there's only so much you can do in five days. Luckily, the, the home was in pretty, pretty, pretty good shape. But the more time you have, the better. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when you hire, not me, but when you hire a contractor to do a big renovation and they tell you it's going to be done in two months and it's six months later the job's not done. Well, that's what happens with these clients. They say, you know, they're going to they're gonna have their home ready and they actually don't have their home ready. I've, I've shown up to help moving clients on moving day, and when I you know, rang the doorbell, they were still in their pajamas with the newspaper tucked under their arm. Oh, oh is it that time already? <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, we're moving today, you're in your pajamas, and the fish are still in the fish tank. We're in big trouble, you know? So, uh, you know, yeah. Um, I, do, I do a lot of writing. Um, I have uh, on my website, PossePartnersLLC.com, there is a whole section of blogging. You are more than welcome to take anything I've written and use it in your social media. Just please do credit me. Um, and I have lots of resources for realtors too. Like, for example, um, I, I have, uh, I'm actually going to a, a seller's home fair right after I leave here, and I have a, a handout that I'm giving at the seller's fair called Downsizing and Right Sizing Tips and Tricks. So I, you can have this. You can have this kind of stuff, again, as long as you reference me. So whatever kind of organizing tips you need, um, very friendly, take my card. What else can I tell you? Questions? Guys, we're all stunned. Go ahead. P-O-S-S-E. Oh, okay. Could you tell All us caps, what that stands yes. for? Sure. Posse, um, do I have time for a quick story? Does this, does this end at 11, 30, or 12? 12. I forget. 12, 12. No. okay. Because I don't want to take away your time. Um, so Posse is actually an acronym for Professional Organizing Solutions Serving Everyone. And then I say dot, 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 who wants to dwell, sell, or move. So um, my logo is a lasso because... 13 years ago when I was trying to form my company, I was looking for a name and I really loved the PODS acronym, the Container Company, uh, Portable On Demand Storage, that's what PODS stands for, and I wanted to use 
the word professional, the word organizing, and the word either services or solutions. So my brain went pos, and then um, I went all oh, posse, posse. I could round up the clutter. And uh, at the time, I was teaching line dancing, and it had nothing to do. It really had nothing to do with my dancing, but posse worked. So that's what posse is. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for waiting. Oh, uh, I think there was another question. I, I actually, it was just more of an observational comment. Um, it's nice to see that a professional certified organizer uses post-its. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. I've been in her houses during her cleanup, there, or during her organizing. These things are everywhere. We need a truckload sometimes just for her post-its. No, I've, 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 I've seen it. Jeff is a former investment banker, which uh, let do real estate investment, and uh, he owns Junk Lovers franchise, and uh, he removes junk, but he does other things too. So, tell us what you remove. Right. So, uh, right. I own uh, Junk Lovers franchise. I, we operate Union County North, so basically, you know, the entire northern part of the state, uh, and. It seems simple. We remove not just junk, but pretty much anything except for underground oil tanks. <laughs> um, but we don't. We, in, in all seriousness, we don't take um, household chemicals or paints. Uh, I'll give you a good idea for paint in a second. But we remove pretty much any and everything. Um, anything from one item, a mattress or television, up to an entire house cleanup. So we charge based on volume. If you haven't used a service like ours before. We charge based on the amount of space in our truck that the items take up. So anywhere from a minimum charge, which is in Bergen County, $135, up to a full truck, which is $699. A full truck, if you understand spatial sort of recognition, is 15 cubic yards, yards, which is 10 refrigerators or roughly 15 to 18 uh, washing machines or dryers, just for a visual reference. So we can pack a lot into a truck. Um, what we do, and, it's, and some trucks, a lot of jobs are more than one truck. But that's our price per truck. Um, what we do with the stuff that we take, anything that's donatable or recyclable, we donate it. We do donate it. We donate it on our customer, which is your client's behalf. They get the tax deductible receipt, so they get the tax write off. Anything that's recyclable, metal, um, electronics, we take to a metal or electronic recycling center, and the rest is basically. Uh, waste or garbage. Paper, we, we try not to take a lot of household papers because of social security numbers. We don't do shredding ourselves. We can you know, bring in someone that we use for shredding, but we will also take um, books and other papers and we take that to a paper recycling facility. So anything that we can keep out of a landfill, we do. Honestly, it's beneficial for everybody. Our customers get the tax deduction. It keeps items out of the landfill and we're not paying, honestly, to dump it. So it helps our margin. So everybody really benefits the environment, our customer, and us. So we really do focus on, um, on on donating and recycling. There are a lot of companies like me that say that they do that, but I challenge you to go to a donation center and look whose truck shows up all day. It's probably not going to be theirs, but it, it will be ours. Um, a lot of people say, um, you know, I'm just going to call the Salvation Army, but good luck with that. Uh, unless you plan, and, and Jean Marie can probably vouch for this, way ahead of time, they're not going to be available if you have a closing on Friday and you call them on Monday. They're six to eight weeks out. They're not going to take a lot of the stuff. They only take things that are in pristine condition that they know that they can sell. They also may not take items down steps from uh, a second floor of a home or up steps from a basement. So it sounds all well and good to just call the Salvation Army because they're free, but ultimately they may not provide you the service that you really need, and it's going to take time. And we get those calls all the time with a closing tomorrow. Can you please come? The seller did not get rid of anything. And they go, well, how much is it? Oh, I don't know, it's a couple things. And we show up and it's truckloads worth of stuff. Um, and we can do that. We have six trucks, I have 15 full-time guys. With a little bit of lead time, we can most likely solve that problem for you. But there are times of the year when we're really, really busy. So plan ahead, tell your sellers, like Jean Marie, start ahead of time. Like we charge based on volume. We don't need to do the entire you know, house at once, which is overwhelming. 
and I've seen it, and I think Jean Marie sold herself short a little bit as to, you know, she, she just is an organizer. She's really a psychologist. <laughs> we deal with it too, and, and it is so hard to get rid of things, especially for seniors who are kind of transitioning, and it's, it's you know, they think everything, I'm sure you've seen this, everything they have is beautiful and great because it's theirs, right? But we see it very differently, and it's really hard for them to let go, and then we show up, and we've been standing there with arguments between the kid and the mom or the dad or the husband and the wife, and it happens all the time. So we really try to tell people, plan ahead. Let us come. We'll do an estimate. If it's five truckloads, let's do one now of all the garbage that you know has to go from the garage or the basement. Let us clear some of that out, which really, frankly, makes more room for Jean Marie or anybody else just to even work and move around. And there's some stuff that's clearly trash that you need to get rid of, or some stuff that you know you can't donate, a sleeper sofa, for instance. Nobody's taking that as a donation. So when you have one in the, in the, in the study or in a basement, that's going to the garbage no matter what. So stuff like that that we know you can get rid of. Um, like I said, plan ahead, chemicals and, how, and, uh, and, and paint. Nobody's going to take that. It's very hard to get rid of. We can't even take it in our trucks. We're highly regulated by the DEP. You wouldn't think it. We just remove garbage. It's 15 months just to get a license to do what we do. Um, so we can't put, nobody can put chemicals in their trucks unless you are certified for that. But each county or town, a couple times a year, has a, a chemical and paint disposal uh, uh, as a day, hazardous waste day. Um, I'm going to stop are... you for one second. Everybody should have the BCUA.org website memorized. Mm -hmm. Tell all your clients right now, get on there and see when the tire electronic shredding and hazmat recycling is for this spring. Make sure it's on their calendar so they can get the hazmat out and not be dealing with it. Okay. We leave. I mean, every time. Burton County. Burton County Utility Authorities .org. Every time we do a clean out for, you know, right before closing, we always leave a pile of chemicals and cleaners in a basement or a laundry room or a garage. There's just nothing we can do about it. It's just not something. And people will generally understand, but if you get ahead of the curve and do it proactively, with, with regards to paint, which everyone has cans of paint in their garage, tell your sellers, listen, open up the can, go get some kitty litter. Pour the kitty litter in it, leave it open for a week, it will dry it right up solid. Then you can just throw it out in your garbage can, like any other garbage, or we can take it, but it has to be dry. The issue with paint is wet paint. So if you fill it with kitty litter, no problem, if only it works for an oil tank. <laughs> for an oil tank. Don't try this at all. And ironically, I'm in the middle of an oil tank problem right now on a house that I'm buying, so it's interesting to see this perspective. And throw the prescription drugs in that as well. In the kitty litter? Right, you can take those. A lot of police stations now yeah. take yeah, if you yeah. can't prescription find drugs station, because they don't want so. people. Yeah. But if you can't find I know sometimes it's hard to find them. Yeah. 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 Out of all those things from one place in the house to another. Yeah, we will. So we we're not stagers and we're not movers. We don't do moving. Right. But if you're if you want us to help stage the house a little bit and just say you know move that dresser from that right. room to this room, yeah, we will we will do that. If you just want us for that. We charge a labor charge per hour for that. Which is um, it depends if we're doing junk removal at the same time. Usually we do it in conjunction with removal. Right. It's ninety nine dollars an hour. If it's just the moving, it's one hundred thirty dollars an hour, which is the equivalent of having a moving company yeah, yeah. there. Um, most often we do that in conjunction with removing some items. Um, usually the stager is like we don't you don't need to empty a house completely to stage it. You just need to get a couple of those big bulky items or those huge desks that people have out of a room. Do you so, move pool tables? Uh, we do. They're hard to move, though, and keep them intact. Um, we can remove them, but oftentimes that requires destroying them. Because they're brought in, the slate's brought in usually in three pieces, and then put down and the felt's put over it. They don't come out. So, so just so get neat. a regular pool table mover. You, you, you can try, yeah. It's hard to move pool tables. It's, it's very difficult to get rid of a piano. Um, everyone thinks like I had this beautiful piano. Yeah, but you and a hundred other people too have the same piano. There's really no market for used pianos or a very small market. But then also, if someone's going to buy a piano, how are they going to move it? You need to call a piano mover. Unfortunately, you destroy a lot of pianos. 
had a client put a Yamaha grand piano, perfect condition, no family, no church, nobody would take it. Nobody wants it. street was a garbage. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was awful. Yeah, we do that all the time. Wow. Um, hot tubs, the same oh. thing. Oh. An old, a non-functioning hot tub in the backyard. Just get rid of it now because you, it's going to come up on your home inspection anyway. We're going to end up taking it. You might as well get rid of it and make the patio look larger. Uh, we do that. Most of them we can remove without cutting them apart. If they're very large or in a difficult spot, we'll cut them apart to remove it. So we really will take any and everything. Um, but I would say just try to get a little bit ahead of it because I'd say 75% of the cleanouts that we do prior to a Real estate, a closing for a house that's on the market are within 48 hours of the closing. Yeah. And it's a mad dash. And then you remove stuff and people say, like, they take the carpet up, oh, look at the floor. The floors are different colors because the carpet's been covering the floor for 50 years and the sun hasn't been beating on it. And now you've got a buyer who says, well, I want credit because look, the floor is all terrible. So, you know, you kind of really want to get ahead of these things. It really sounds like I'm just a junk removal guy. but. It's really not that simple. You've all dealt with sellers and buyers. Sellers are difficult to deal with, and buyers are difficult to deal with. I've been on both ends of everything. So just call us ahead of time and let us get started a little bit now and a little bit later. It's just much easier also on the psyche of your seller. I actually stopped using the word junk removal companies when I offer these kinds of services to my clients because I think language is very important and it sounds like you're calling their stuff junk when in a lot of cases you're trying to declutter a house it's not actually junk and because they keep as much as possible out of the landfill and donate as much as possible whether they're bringing stuff back for Habitat for Humanity, Restore, Antique Places, whatever it is um, I, I say I say green hauling company now and I explain to my clients, I know um, that it looks a little odd that these trucks are pulling up, but you have to understand that just a very tiny percentage of what's going in that truck is going to a landfill. Most of it is going to go to people who can use it. And when you tell that to people, they feel much better about letting it go. And in many cases, depending on the sense of urgency and the speed at which the sale is happening, um, it takes only a couple of hours to utilize Jeff's service where it might take weeks if not months for clients to bag everything up, take it to the donation center, wait for somebody to show up at their house in their zip code. So it's if time is really important and your clients are behind the eight ball, you could get a house ready in a few hours as opposed to a few months. So awesome, awesome service. The, the one thing I will say is we are not the cheapest um, solution. Your cheapest solution is going to be getting a dumpster and doing all the work yourself. But that's usually not practical. Most people can't. I mean, my guys are big, strong, young guys. I'm not the guy who does all the <laughs> My hands are computer now. But it's, you know, homeowners try to do it. And how are you going to get that huge armor out of your house? You're not just going to call your grandson and say, can you come over and move it? Um, so, you know, and then are you going to damage your floors and your walls while you're in the middle of the building? Um, you know, we really, this is all we do. If you want the cheapest solution, that will not be us. But we are the best solution. Our guys show up, we're insured, uh, we know what we're doing. If for some chance we do damage something, we will come back and fix it. The interesting thing about me is that things happen, right? I mean, it's, it's impossible to say. Anyone who says, I went a whole year, we did 4,000 removal jobs, and we didn't damage anything. They're lying, right? That's just not possible. So once in a while, things happen. It's just inevitable. Um, but what, and, and oftentimes, people will say, well, we'll say, well, how'd you get this in here? Oh, we got it in there. It's been there forever. And then when you continue to question them, oh, you know what? We, we remodeled the kitchen, we moved the door, <laughs> yeah. right. and we made it smaller. Yeah. Like, oh, OK, yeah. well, now it makes sense. And then as we're trying to get it out, you know, we damage the door accidentally. But we'll come back and, and we'll fix it. Like we're not in the business, we're not a fly-by-night company. We're not in the business of doing a job for somebody once. We want to do a job for somebody many times. Um, and the interesting thing about me, since I'm in the real estate business and I, I have a lot of contractors on speed dial, I'll get my guy there the next day to fix the wall, paint the wall, fix the floor, whatever. Um, you know, it's just how we operate. Um, 
and we're building a brand just like all of you have spent time building your personal brand and your real estate brand. We're a brand. You want to call a guy up from Craigslist? He'll probably be cheaper than us, but you know, good luck. Do you really want that guy showing up, um, sure you know, in a beat up pickup truck? And and you know, our guys are background checked. Um, they're all you know, criminal check, background check. They're not crim that they're not criminal. Um, so you know, we take our job very very seriously, um, and we try to you know, we want to make you guys look great, right? You want to when someone refers you as a realtor, you want to call. Call Joe or call Jane. They they brought everyone we needed. I didn't have to make another phone call. Um, you know, that's kind of the service that we provide. Yes. When you, I think you said if you have the hot a hot tub in your deck or something to get rid of it. Why why would you want to get rid of it? Maybe it it's most of the hot tubs out there in older homes don't work. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. It doesn't so work. It doesn't work. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say get rid of, people know if their hot tub doesn't work, right? <laughs> so if you know it doesn't work and otherwise he's going to come over and do an inspection and say it doesn't work, you might as well just get rid of it now. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing too with, with, with inspections is like for me when I sell a house, I just proactively tell people that's why it's good to do the pre-inspection. Like, you know what, I know this doesn't work, I'll fix it. And people think that, that, you know, that the perception of that honesty is great because you're not going to try to screw them on selling the house. Um, so I would just take it out, you know, take it out now, call us to remove it. But also, if you know it doesn't work and a hot tub is taking up, you know, 40% of your patio, just get rid of it so that the backyard looks, you know, looks better. And what was the deal for removal outside hot It depends. <laughs> it depends on the size and how difficult it is to remove um, and how easily we can get it out. Um, anywhere from three to $800. Um, you know, people think that's a lot of money, but don't forget the cost of that hot tub originally was. Um, <coughs> found metallic rock builders will get rid of their their old building materials and throw right. it in the field and cover it over. Yeah. Yeah. So what is metallic rock? Metallic rock. So like, like iron ore. Iron. Yeah. yeah so one. are there a particular area in New Jersey where you see a lot of metallic rocks? Um, like Hiawatha. Oh. Uh, I found that in. Was that Madison? Uh, there's some areas that are very specific. Yeah. I had a uh, like I I was representing the buyer and we did it and it was in Edison. Okay, <laughs> and they found metallic rock in the ground. Yes. Yeah, it was like a basically just a, um, a geological. Not even rock. It was a soil. The soil is metallic. Wow. Okay. Is that dangerous? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 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 it's a new one on me. Yeah, it doesn't sound good. So you say like, um, if you see uh, see a large reading, it's not always a tank. It could be correct. And, and I, how much and you I, charge for digging? To do an exploratory dig, uh, I do it all by hand. I don't have a machine, so I'm kind of old school. Hands? Well, I use like, a shovel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not a dog. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I usually charge like six fifty for an exploratory dig oh. with a report. Okay. And if you get a tank, will you cover that digging or? I don't do the removal of tanks. Oh, you don't do no, that? No, no, no. I just do the sweeps. Yep, I, oh, yeah, my background is on that the removal, clean up, all that stuff. That it's forwards, so, but I just it's always it. a good idea to have a different contractor do the removal oh, yeah. than the person who discovered Why? Just, just conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Conflict, conflict of interest. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, and if you do have a tank removed, make sure that it's a certified, um, licensed uh, tank remover in the state of New Jersey because if a leak is discovered and you didn't, if you just used your brother-in-law who has access to a backhoe, um, you will not get the grant money if a leak is discovered. If, if you can't prove that it was um, I mean, yeah, removed properly, there's no grant money for you. Uh, I don't know, my question is for you or her. Um, have you uh, came across where the tank was filled with foam and it still leaked? <coughs> and it still what? Leaked. Absolutely. There are chances? Oh yeah. Uh, tanks that were filled, um, much more limited inspection as opposed to removal. So you can imagine with a sand fill tank or a concrete fill tank, what have you, um, you dig down to the top generally, cut it open, you pump it out, you clean it out, because uh, it can get in there, clean out the tank, and then an inspector comes out, looks you know, eight feet into a dark hole. I've never even seen a flashlight and says, all right, it looks good, and then they fill it with material. So it's a very limited inspection. With foam fill tanks, it's generally done directly through the fill pipe. 
So you're not even digging down and cleaning the tank out. You're basically pumping out all the oil and then injecting foam down that 200 diameter pipe into the tank. It expands and hardens, makes it structurally sound, but there's no inspection at all. So there's a lot of times that those tanks that were filled properly, you have all the paperwork, uh, people think that it's a done issue, it, they, they're all coming out now, and there's a lot of issues that are now. So who is liable? It's buyer beware issue, so the current owner is the responsible party. Only current owner? Right. Not the person who did it? Not the companies who yeah. did it? Well, that's between the uh, homeowner, that's the homeowner's issue between them and the people who did it. If okay. they want to file a lawsuit, that's up to them. Okay. But they're ultimately responsible. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I came across a house where they had a monitoring well, uh, like four or five houses away from the, maybe three houses away from the, this particular subject house. Uh, they had a, a gas station. Okay. And that gas station, old, old tank leaked, and it leaked throughout the neighborhood. And now the neighbors have a well. So how difficult or what would be the buyer looking when they're buying such a property? So they have a monitoring well on their <coughs> property now. Got it. Well, a lot of times um, those wells are installed to um, well, triangulate groundwater flow, mm -hmm. to determine which direction the groundwater is flowing so that way they can uh, remedy the issue accordingly. Uh, so that's maybe the reason why they have, well, it doesn't mean it's contaminated there necessarily. It may just be to make a determination as to which way the groundwater is flowing and seeing if it is impacting that property or not. Um, best, quite, best way to handle that is to contact the DEP. There's undoubtedly a case manager handling that at that point, or the company that's doing the work and, and try to get an answer as to what's going on, why is this here, where do we stand. A commercial property like that, certainly the DEP is uh, undoubtedly involved, and they can give you proper direction. So buyer can buy such a property, like what they should be looking from the DEP, a certificate, or? Um, basically to find out where they stand in the remediation process, how far along they are, where, you know, if there, if there is contamination of the groundwater underneath their property. These are all questions under the Community Right to Know Act that they are entitled to, to get answers to. So if remediation is complete, so what you will suggest the buyer? If, once the remediation is complete, the DEP issues what's called a no further action letter. Uh, at that point, uh, wells are sealed, they're required to be sealed. So uh, I just did a tank the other day, they had removed a tank already, there was a well in the front yard, and I said, she said, we're just waiting for that NFA, the no further action letter to be issued any day now. I said, we'll just make sure after that it is issued that they seal the well properly. Mm -hmm. So the well driller has to properly seal that well. So you, when you do the oil tank swift, you will come across there as a well? Is there a metal part which has gone inside? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, usually just a cap at grade if there's an active well, monitor well. So, like, uh, uh, my question was, like, what the pipe which went, it was made of metal or it was concrete pipe? No, the pipes are now or generally either metal or plastic. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, um, I've got a question actually. Um, it's really, so I have a friend, luckily it's not my client. She bought a house 10 years ago and she knew there was a decommissioned tank. And she decided to take it out because the neighbor was doing it. When she took it out, she realized she had a lot of pain. So, okay, so that brings up another question like, okay, so like around 10 years ago or, you know, prior to that, the realtor doesn't tell us to do the oil tank sweep. So does that mean we should advise all the people who intend to sell, not even right now, maybe a few years down the road, just try to sweep it, you know, prevent it because it might take a while if you have exactly. it yep. and if you have to do the remedy, yep. right? That's my gospel, do a proactive oil right. tank sweep. And then, okay, so, if like you don't know that there was a tank, and now when you do the sweep, you found the tank, you have to remove it. If it's contaminated, is a fund available? Right. Because yes. insurance won't cover, I assume, yes. because nobody knows. There is a grant that takes a while to get reimbursed, but ultimately yes. Five so, years it'll take. Yeah, that's what I was told, so that's yeah. why I thought five that years. people should do it as preventive as soon as possible, because you might Correct. want to sell in five years. Right? Correct. Thanks. When a builder does new construction on a property, are they automatically doing an oil tank soup? Like you, do, when you buy new construction, do you know that that land is clear? No, uh, it's in their best interest to do it because it could ultimately come back to bite them. Um, I found circumstances, brand new homes, uh, you know, new development, yeah. 
um, and found a tank on a property because it just so happened to be farmland, and that just so happened to be the lot where the farmer had an underground diesel tank, and you know nobody knew about it. So it's yeah, it's good to be proactive as a, as a buyer and a builder before you develop that land just to make sure. So there's no laws for new contractors or new construction to regulate that all this needs to be checked before they're allowed to bring Unfortunately ground? Unfortunately not. No. Because I, ha I have one case, one buyer, she thought she was buying a like, new construction, well, I mean, the seller bought it as a new construction, but they were built on top of their existing foundation. Right. And so my buyers say, you know, we want to run it, and he was surprised. Actually, there's an underground oil tank in the cell that he did not know. Right. So isn't that the uh, uh, fund that is available? Does it uh, is it a first come first serve? I mean, does it start at the beginning of the fiscal year? And it's a first come first serve, and uh, as the money is replenished, they keep uh, filling, they keep uh, fulfilling the uh, applications. So there's a stack this big, and if in in this year they use this many, they use up this many, then next year. And when it's replenished next year, they'll start here, and they'll just keep going. So it's important to get on that stack. Get in queue. Get in queue. Right. If a builder builds a house without a basement, mm -hmm. so it could be possible that an oil tank is underneath that house, right? Sure. I now, when you come in, you don't. Out. No one would ever know. It. It's yep. just going to be there, and it's leaking, it's leaking. Until maybe you see contaminated, uh, you know, water shooting out somewhere. Uh, you know, a, a plume of oil coming out, you know, onto the street, something like that. But otherwise, no, you would never know. I mean, I couldn't. I, I don't scan under structures. So there's too much metal interference. Yeah, that was my question. You don't like uh, scan in the structure, right? No. 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 Nope. Nobody does. There's too much interference. There's no way to know for sure. Mm -hmm. Even ground penetrating radar companies can't guarantee anything under a structure. Okay. But under the driveway, can you scan it? Sure. As long as it's an asphalt driveway without any rebar, no problem at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've been monopolizing a lot of this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's great. This is really, that's how I felt. It's important. Is it commercial for him? I, I sit in a lot, of, I wear a lot of hats on it. I buy and sell properties, I, I own properties. If that two hundred seventy five dollars for your sellers or buyers is like the cheapest insurance you will ever buy. Mm -hmm. Because the cost of remediation of a significant leak is like many, many, many multiples right. of that two hundred seventy five dollars really is the cheapest insurance you could buy. I never inspect houses when I buy them. That's why I'm able to buy them kind of the way I, I do and I buy the worst houses. I always always good. always do a tank sweep because that's the one thing that will bite you in the end. In, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> will bite you and will take a big chunk out. So yeah, it's really like the, the, the best, cheapest insurance you could, you could buy. Hey, well, why don't we move on to Concierge, you're the go-to person. So, just tell us a little bit what you're sure. doing, how you can help facilitate the transaction. You bet. Um, and I have to say, after listening to this conversation, my job is really easy. <laughs> I just deal with your client's stuff. Um, I'm not dealing with these kind of issues. But um, before I talk, I just wanted to put on my affiliate chair hat. So I am your 2018 affiliate chair for Real Source, and I want to let you all know, if you don't know as of yet. There are about a hundred of us affiliates in the RealSource database. So all you have to do is go on your realsource.org homepage. If you need any kind of resource, I would love it if you would start here at realsource.org, whether you're looking for a home inspector, you know, um, a sweet person, an organizer, junk removal, financial person, etc. So there was my little plug. Okay. <laughs> So my name is Jean Marie Heron, and I am a CPO, which is a certified professional organizer. And when Larry was organizing mm -hmm. this wonderful Ask the Expert panel and topics, he sent a great question. And I actually thought about it, and I wanted to read my response to Larry's question as an opening. 
So Larry's question was, after a listing agreement is signed and it's time to market the house, how can an agent use your service or business help to prepare the home for sale and or facilitate a successful transaction? So as an organizer, I believe that the best advice is for the Realtors to be able to educate your clients on utilizing and organizing service to help them prepare um, and to let them know that they don't have to do this themselves anymore. 30, 40 years ago they did, you know, and they counted on their families and their neighbors and, and whoever else, but nowadays there's a service for everything. Um, so if you feel like your clients are overwhelmed and paralyzed and they don't know where to turn, I highly recommend you tell them about NAPO, which is the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Specialists, and I'm in the Bergen County area. Um, but the, your clients, which maybe, maybe you don't have a lot of overwhelmed and paralyzed clients, but I do, and those are the homes I'm in. I'm in the homes of people who have been in their houses for decades. And unfortunately, for decades, they really haven't gotten rid of anything. And now they want to sell their house, and they don't have any idea of how to take their first step. Um, and a, you know, a great organizer will be able to come in and de-stress the experience by helping them with a game plan to keep them on task and on time with your advice. So when you're done sitting at the kitchen table and you've given them maybe, you know, uh, a legal pad through a, a legal pad list of everything you'd like them to do before you put the sign in the lawn. An organizer can come in, take that list, and figure out. It's really project management. It's really time management. But an organizer can help them figure out the time frame, the goals, and keep them really on task and on time. Um, we can assist them figure with figuring out the hundreds, and it's actually thousands of decisions that they need to make in a home. If you just walk into a foyer and there's a table there and it has one drawer and you open up that one drawer, there might be 250 things in that one drawer. And eventually, when they're done selling the house, it has to be in broom swept condition and their next step is moving. And they have to make 250 decisions on every item that's in that drawer. And now you look at the whole foyer, and now you look at the whole closet, and then you walk into the kitchen, and then you walk into the bathrooms, and then you walk into the bedrooms, and then you go up to the attic, and you go down to the basement, and the crawl space, and the garage, and the outer buildings, and it's huge. And the biggest thing is it takes a ton of time, and an organizer will work with them one-on-one -on -one to help them through the process. Um, so that's the decision making is, is tremendous and because we are really experts in helping them decide, we have like a little devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, you know, should I keep it, should I pay a mover to move it, if my house burnt down would I miss it, is it going to fit in the new place, should I give it to my daughter, should it go to the, you know, Vermont house, should it go to the Florida house, and really we can, it's like a big elephant and we can help them chug it down. Um, we help them with figuring out what's going to stay for the photographing, especially for the MLS photos and the walkthroughs. And, you know, we can give them all kinds of decluttering services, what's going to be tossed, shredded, sold, given to family, staged. And we have wonderful resources. Just like every realtor has a guy for that, an organizer has a guy for that too. <coughs> Guys like Jeff over here. Um, but we have, you know, wonderful charities that we work with. We work with green junk removal companies. We work with all kinds of estate sale companies, online auction companies, hauling container and moving companies, and they're all in our back pockets. Um, as a certified professional organizer, I really become that rent a daughter if there's no daughter in the area to help their parents through the process, who physically as well as spiritually lifts these clients out of their transitional chaos, because that's what they're in. You know, this is a moment in time, but they might only move a few times in their life or sell a few times in their life, but we're doing this every single day. So it's, you know, you move it from one house to another kind of a thing. Um, so that's really what I do. In a nutshell, when people say, Jean Marie, what do you do? I say, I give people permission to let go. <coughs> okay? Because the selling, the moving, and, you know, going from one house to another is all about letting go and starting new. And it's huge. And besides all these other outside pressures in terms of, you know, home inspections and um, all the other things that could go wrong, 
they still have to function in that home when it's going up for sale. So we could help set up solutions, storage solutions, and systems while they're going through the process. Um, yes? Um, maybe Jeff should be the one to ask. Um, now you're hearing about all these scams when people are throwing away paperwork that they have with social security numbers and all that. Do either of you have someone that um, what do you do? Shreds, Shreds. Shreds the stuff. Can I answer yes. that? Um, yes. work at Morgan Stanley. And every now and again, I see a client come in with a huge bag. But what if you can't get the bag to you? Is well, there someone that comes there, and there does are it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There are oh. services. It's freely sure. available. I'm going to say if you have a, a financial yes. person that works for a big company, we shred documents like crazy. Yeah. Literally and in the office, the there are five. And, and well, there are services that will do it. Because they sure say don't let people take it away bag. from your house. That's the new thing. Because you don't know if they're going to go through bags right. they of have, they social have security. A lot of towns have a couple times a year. But only take shredding. two or three bags. Well, that's, that's, well, that's, and but I think where you can help is not just the shredding. Physically, but advising what to shred. Reminding people right. what kind of paperwork. What not to throw out. Right. So I always have, you know, the IRS record retention guidelines with me. I do this all the time, and I'm very careful with any personal identification. Um, there are townwide shredathons that come up where the truck is there. Most of them are pretty good in Bergen County. If you go to Camp or Bergen Community, right. you and they're, you know, even though they tell you four boxes is the limit. But depending I have a on a house. Year old okay. Woman. Let me finish. Let me finish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me finish. So that's an option for most households. Mm -hmm. Most households can bring four boxes, okay? And with a camera, you watch the truck right there. There, you, all you have to do is Google. I can think of six companies right now that will drive to the front of the house and they will destruct it right there with the camera yeah. in front. It's minimal cost. What's it's a hundred dollars. What's your? How do we get in touch with? Okay, you? so on the back table, I gave everybody a little gift, oh. and and my business card is in here. Um, I'll give you my little productivity hack right now. So there's a little timer in here, mm -hmm. and it says under two, please do, which means if something takes you less than two minutes, you do it right away, and you check it off your brain. So neurologically, it's now out of your head. Um, so an example of an under two, please do, would be you woke up this morning and a past client left a referral for you on your answering machine. So under two please do is you want to thank them right away. So either text them, call them, send them an email, write a personal note, get it done. So that's your little productivity, productivity trick. Um, do you back to for what you're telling us? Can I just finish the shredding oh. question? So um, I've been in many homes where they're scared to death of theft identity and there are 22 boxes mm -hmm. of information. Right. For $100, you call one of these companies, they drive to your house, you get it all out. It's just as wonderful as calling a green junk removal company and pointing to the two men that have the brawn and the capacity to climb up in the cabana or go way down into the cellar. And in a matter of a couple hours, for a couple hundred dollars, you can declutter a home and get it just about ready for sale. Yeah. Um, so the way I work is very simple. I get a phone call from a, you know, a, a potential client, and if, it, if we have a little phone interview and if it seems like a great fit, um, I do something called a walk and talk. It's my needs assessment. I charge $79 for the assessment. I go to the person's house. We walk through so that I can visually see the home because I need to determine the scope of project for this particular client. I need to know the volume that's in the house. I need to figure out the resources. And what I mean by the resources, I'm sort of like the queen bee of categorizing. So when I go into a person's home and I look at a lot of clutter, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what might be going into storage for this client? What might be recycled for this client? If I'm in a garage or a basement, what's going to hazmat? I'm trying to figure out how much shredding there's going to be. I'm trying to figure out how much donating there's going to be. I'm trying to figure out what can possibly be packed and get it out of the way now. I might be trying to figure out how much needs to be sold in this house. I want to find out how much junk needs to be removed from this house. I want to see what kind of decision makers my clients are because maybe they're undecided. And if they're still very fuzzy on their goals and their times and what they want to do, they're not going to move quickly. So 
categorizing the home is very important. I can put together a very simple or a very complicated action plan. You know, what's going to happen with every room in the house? What's the deadline? Who's going to be responsible? So I do a needs assessment for about an hour, and then at the end of the hour, I eyeball the project based on my experience, and I suggest a package. It might be, you know, Mr. Homeowner, this is really easy. Your potential problem is just your home office. We can do your home office in a half-day organizing session. A half-day organizing session is called my power hours, which I charge $2.95 for. And if it's a big home project, and I do specialize in now in what I call home, whole home decluttering, most of my clients are uh, getting their house ready to sale, and it's a very big job. So I usually sell a five session package or a 10 session package. Five session package is 1425, 10 sessions is 2700. Really breaks out to <clears throat> multiples of that, and they probably delivered it with a forklift for eight or 10 people because they build that into the price of the hot tub. Right. Same thing with the piano and, you know, very large furniture. Um, you know, it was delivered by many, many people and, and when it was bought for a great you know, price, that was all built into the price. So people sometimes balk at that because it sounds like a lot of money, but if we're talking about sending, you know, four or six guys to spend three or four hours to remove something, we want to make sure we don't damage the home. We have special tools for hot tubs. We have special dollies and things that we use to help move them. But sometimes they were craned over a house. I mean, we've seen situations where, and no one likes to tell you that. For some reason, they think by not telling us the challenge that it's just going to save them money. You know, people call us and say, I only have a couple things. How much is it going to be? I don't know, a couple, two, three hundred dollars. When we get there, five times as much. Well, you told me it was going to be two hundred dollars. But you only told me you have a sofa and a love seat. Um, you know, a great example of this, and, and you know, we did a house, um, we did an estimate for a clean out for a guest house in Saddle River. The estimate for the guest house was three truckloads. We get, that was a month and a half ago. We don't hear anything. We call, follow up, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. We got a call last Monday, can you please come this afternoon to do the clean out? No problem, we go there to clean out the guest house woman says, well, I need to do the rest of the house, too, and I need it done by tomorrow at 5. <laughs> it was a 10,000 square foot house. It was 25 truckloads. Wow. It was as if every closet and cabinet and vanity, whatever was inside it, just threw it all up uh. into the house. Um, oh and really, I blame you may work with you, to the, the estate sale people who set everything up, took everything out, sold 10% of it, and then just left. And they leave that mess. That's the other thing to think about, too. Yeah. Nobody, the estate sale people don't clean up after they're done. Wow. Right? Everything's just left. So it was 20, yeah, it was 25 truckloads. We did the job. Wow. It took us six days. We told them it's just not possible. But it was another situation where people don't, when, when the stuff is spread out throughout a home, it doesn't seem like a lot. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. When you start putting it all together, there's a lot of stuff even in a, in a small home. Especially so, 10,000 square foot. Right. Yeah, I mean, for look, for us, it was great. It was a great job. But again, it was seller was the seller was difficult. She said, no, this stays, this stays. The buyer wants that, the buyer wants that. We thought we finished. We get a call from the buyer. Why'd you guys leave all this stuff? <laughs> you know, well, we were told to. Well, that's not the case. You know, we have to go back. And, and, and you have, you know, an argument between the, the realtor, the buyer, the seller, and we're just kind of in the middle saying, just, you know, just tell us what you want. Um, it could have been resolved if we had started three months ago, a month and a half ago, whenever we did the original estimate, but people just, you know, weren't ready, so. Quick question, do you also do outside junk, like uh, sheds, old, old uh, swing sets? Yep, we do swing sets, we do, we'll do sheds, mm -hmm. we'll take, you know, we'll, we don't do demolition, interior demolition, right. um, but we will, you know, we'll do sheds, we do swing sets, we do a lot, a lot of those old wood swing sets that are kind of rickety, um, you know, we'll go, we'll cut them apart. Do you charge by per truck, or how do you charge? Per truck. Per truck? Yeah, and fractionally in the truck. So we charge for you know, a minimum, a quarter, a half, three quarters, and then there's a lot of fractions in between. Okay, is there any website or like where we can? Yeah, you could go. I have my cards over there. It's called junkluggers.com. Mm -hmm. um, all caps, but it doesn't stand for anything. <laughs> <laughs> no no, no line dancing? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have any great story. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's, yeah, junk luggers.
Allgrace.com. Um, you can go online. You can read our reviews. We have tons of reviews. Um, like I so said, we, we, we stand by what we say. Okay. I have a quick story, just very uh, 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 relative. Uh, I had a hot tub on my deck that wasn't working for the last few years. And I got a quote from the junk company. Um, I thought it was high, so I said I could do this myself. I had a sawzall, and I proceeded over the course of two days to cut it into pieces enough to fit into contractor bags. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> I so wish I paid the money. It's so worth it. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, what I would tell people, I tell your clients is, that your, their time is worth money too. Right? Yes. <laughs> How much time do they want to spend totally. trying to do what we can do in a matter of yep. hours? I mean, I'm the same way, right? I have a business. I have time, I own my business. I can be home mowing the lawn, but it's not worth my time. It's worth my time be doing my other things, working on my business, so I don't do that thing. Um, but my wife is practically a hoarder, which is crazy. I almost be, I almost be organized, but I tell her all the time, like, you gotta clean this stuff up, you gotta clean this stuff up, and do it now, let's not do it, let's not do it later. You know, you really just wanna get ahead of it, and your, your clients don't have time for this stuff. It takes so much more time than people think, like, oh, I'll just clean out the closet. Yep. It's just, it's not that, not that simple for most people. Yeah, when the, if it's an estate, you know, an out of sale, you know, a, a nephew or a niece who inherited a house and they're in for a couple of days and they don't care about anything, no problem. You know, we'll clean it right out. But for most people, it's it's not a matter of just take everything. The alternative is if your clients don't want to do that and they don't want to take the oil tank out of the ground and they don't want to deal with an inspection, and they don't want to get rid of all the stuff. Yeah. Just call me and I'll buy the house. <laughs> Everyone's problems. Does it hurt the sale price? Real solutions. You're not going to get as much money, but you're not going to deal with the you know, all the headaches. <laughs> but if you bring me a house, I will gladly give it back to you to sell, even though my wife is my realtor. But anyone who I believe in, you know, in doing business that way, and if you did bring me a house and brought me in and I was able to buy it, I'm more than happy to just give it back to you to resell. What are you looking for? That's fair. Anything. Something to put. Or keep if it's a multi-family. Anything. I'm looking for the right price. Whatever that is. <laughs> New Jersey, mostly northern. Mm -hmm. Union County on up. Union, Union County, even Union County as far as it is. But there's good stuff. You will fill out a prospect sheet? <laughs> well, that's the ultimate way, though. You tell your client, listen, I got a guy who'll buy this house tomorrow. Don't worry about anything. <laughs> You make a commission on that side, then I fix it up, and you make a commission again. So. But your wife will get mad. She won't care. Yeah. Plenty of other things to do. I have no other questions. I really want to thank you guys. Tremendous amount of information. Thank you so much for your time.
we have on the outside. Thank you, Larry. Good job. Good job. Good job.
they see me bobbing my head, then they'll listen to music. Or can I do the one on one? Here we go, Mike. Right. <laughs> that's a, that was a prop. I was going to say, it's always good to have vision in this. And that's a good one. You're just always going to be working, 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 working. But I used to run large commercial kitchens for corporate food service. I missed you at the last affiliate meeting. You were out on vacation? No, you know what happened? Courtney was at a bachelorette party in California. Okay. That's too young. And oh, well, she's 24. That's but still too young. She's not getting married. No, but I mean, her friend. Her friend, right? Yeah. yeah. That's how they got scrambled. And their party bus got in an accident. So I, it got it. It happened on the third. She was in the hospital, and we didn't. Her friends were terrific, but that's great. They transferred her to another hospital Sunday in California. Yeah, in Santa Monica. So uh, Michael and I decided Sunday morning that I would fly out to see what was going on, and she ended up being in the hospital till Wednesday, and then we flew. No, yeah, yeah, till Tuesday night. And then we flew home Wednesday, uh, Thursday, Thursday night. What happened to her? She, um, she has a deep like tissue muscle, deep, 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 deep tissue and muscle wound yeah. to her hip, and she might have a hairline fracture. So she's, uh, she was, she had a walker, she came. Wow. She's in a much better place than last week, but now, you know, she's snapchatting about being at 24 and all that stuff, but, um, yeah, she has to go back to the orthopedic next week, and there's not an improvement. We'll do another MRI. <laughs> and she, she's not out there anymore, still, right? No, we flew in yes. Friday morning. Okay, so she's seen a local one. I know, I know. I've been Friday, she's seen a local one. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, yeah. so now I only work under other right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. professional organizer. Yeah. And it would be bad to say her friends were um, terrific. But they're busy, you know, they roll up with me you know, and on their last day project, and I'm like, oh, they ended up leaving on Sunday and Monday. It's funny, and like I told I said, my, we my didn't sister know what was going on, so mm -hmm. I didn't want to leave her out there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it, it was so it was so bad because <laughs> two of them went to the hospital. The other one got released from emergency, but then they ended up on the party bus to get back to the house that they had rented, and they were just like, and then that somebody. Then the next day, <laughs> I, this is funny, but they were supposed they were having like this laundry and change. Yeah. And working, her girlfriends were like, it was just, you know, we tried to laugh at some of the things, everything else, but they were just all worried about Courtney. Then they started not getting hurt, but like they were sore and had, you know, a couple bumps and bruises. So she likes the finances. But her girlfriend, I feel so bad, and so does she, the bride. She's like, do you think Or even if it's not your fault, like somebody cut them off. And yeah. They're not that, that, that would be interesting. And it would be a good thing 10 years from now that they all talk about it. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. And it's gonna be one she's thing still planning on yeah. going. The wedding's the third. Oh, it's going to be cold. So, the wedding's the third. Oh, gosh. Here we go. Everybody's going to hear all our business. <laughs> yeah, that's her. Poor Judy. She's not going to want to know. <laughs>